We've been going through the, the life of David uh, since this fall, and now that we're into the Christmas season, it's kind of hard to know how do I merge the two studies. And so today, uh, we're going to look at a passage from the life of David that is the only story in the Bible that mentions snow. So that seems appropriate uh, for Christmas. Now, the word snow is mentioned several other times, but there are no stories that talk about it actually snowing. So this is in 2 Samuel chapter 23. And this chapter is really kind of like the movie credits at the end of David's life. Have you ever gone to a movie and stuck around at the end to watch the credits? I don't mean like the Marvel movies where you watch to see the extra scenes. Some of you are like, what? Extra scenes? Marvel movies? Because you've always walked out too early. When you go to a Marvel movie, you have to stay at to watch the credits. That's not what I'm talking about. Just read the credits to see how many people it takes to make a movie. And if you read the credits, you see things like uh, makeup artist for Mr. Allen, and it gives the name. You're like, yeah, well, that makes sense. He probably needs a, a makeup artist. And then later on down the credits, you'll see assistant to the makeup artist for Mr. Allen. And that makes sense, too, because... Uh, you know, if you're doing the makeup for the big star, you probably need an assistant. And then later in the credits, you'll see something like container holder for the assistant to the makeup artist for Mr. Allen. You're like, well, I'm not sure that's really necessary. It seems like maybe they have too many people involved here. And then later on, it says something like stand in to the container holder to the assistant for Mr. Allen's makeup. And you're just like, boy, there, I never had any idea it took so many people to make a movie. Well, the same was true in King David's life. You know, we read the stories of King David, and they're amazing. And God did amazing things through David and for David. But always in the background, there are these, these men that we don't really know much about them. Uh, but now in 2 Samuel 23, we get to learn who they are. And it refers to them as David's mighty men. And these are kind of the guys behind the scenes. They were with David in the wilderness when he was running for Saul. They were with David when he became the king. They fought all of his battles and wars with him. When Absalom rebelled, these were the men who were loyal to David. And they led the fight to restore David to the kingdom. And so these are David's mighty men. And we read these stories, and there's some really cool ones there. And I encourage you to read the whole chapter for yourself. But this morning, we're going to focus in on just one of these mighty men. His name is Benaiah. And Benaiah is one of the mighty men that's talked about. Just a couple verses here in 2 Samuel. But let's dive in there. So if you have your Bible, you can open it to 2 Samuel chapter 23. And I'm going to start reading to you about Benaiah in verse 20. It says, There was also Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, a valiant warrior from Kabzeel. He did many heroic deeds, which included killing two champions of Moab. Another time on a snowy day, he chased a lion down into a pit and killed it. And once, armed with a club, he killed an imposing Egyptian warrior who was armed with a spear. Benaiah wrenched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with it. Deeds like these made Benaiah as famous as the three mightiest warriors. So this Benaiah guy is a good warrior. He's a great warrior. So one time he killed two of Moab's champions. Another time he's fighting an Egyptian and he's just got a club like a baseball bat. And the Egyptian has a spear. So Benaiah just drops his club, grabs hold of the spear, pulls it away from the Egyptian, flips it around, and kills him. He's a really tough guy. But I don't know if you caught right in the middle of this story my favorite one, and the one that I think is the most amazing. It says that another time, on a snowy day, he chased a lion down into a pit and killed it. Now, I read a story like this, and that's not a normal thing. And so it raises some questions in my mind. And just so you can have a little peering into the mind of David, the first time I read the story, the first question that came to my mind was, does it snow in the Middle East? I think of the Middle East, and I think of like this desert climate, right? Sand everywhere, really hot, not a lot of water, uh, everything is dry. Does it really snow in the Middle East? It turns out it does. What I did is I decided to go to Google, because if you really need to know something, the most reliable place to find information is the internet. And I just, I just typed in, does it snow in the Middle East? And sure enough, it does. In fact, back in 2013, there was this massive snowstorm in Jerusalem. 
I have a picture there. They were actually throwing snowballs at each other outside the Dome of the Rock. And it, it turns out that Jerusalem and Israel is not that different from the rest of the world, that the first time it snows every year, everybody forgets how to drive. This picture is also from the 2013 snowstorm and probably looks a little bit familiar, right? Maybe you saw something like this last night or this morning. It seems like when it snows, we all lose our head. Now, there's a reason this happens, right? Here it is. I'm going to blow your mind. Snow is slippery. <laughs> all right? So if, if you're not used to driving in the snow, you need to leave a little extra room, take your time, because snow is slippery. Now, apply that principle, slippery snow, to the story of Benaiah. You got this idea. Here's this warrior, and he's chasing a lion. We'll get to that in a minute. He's chasing the lion, and he comes to this pit, and he's going to run downhill into the pit, but it's snowing, so it's slippery. Have you ever run down a hill in snow? If you don't have the right shoes, and by the way, they didn't have moon boots back then, so he's running in sandals, maybe even bare feet. It's very slippery. What's the most likely thing that's going to happen? He's going to slip, slide down the hill into the pit on his backside, and be laying there on his back with a lion ready to pounce. So I have a second question. Does it snow in the Middle East? It does. My second question was, are there lions in the Middle East? Because I, I, I'm one of these people who thinks in categories, right? So I think lions are in Africa and tigers are in Asia. And neither are in the Middle East. I just don't think of those big monstrous cats being in the Middle East. And, and really, for the most part, they're not. 90% of the world's lions are in Africa. But there is this breed of lion known as the Asiatic lion. And, and it resides mostly in Asia. You might pick that up. But it turns out that thousands of years ago, these lions migrated from Africa to Asia. And there are many records that show back during the time of Benaiah, there actually were lions in the land of Israel. Now, what's most intriguing about this particular lion is its size, and I want you to see that. By the way, this also is from the internet, so completely reliable. Uh, an Asiatic lion is 300 to 500 pounds, a little larger than your average puppy dog. Okay? What this means is the lion Benaiah is facing it is possibly two times bigger than him or more. So again, I'm th saying to myself, so we've got, it's snowing, so it's slippery. And Benaiah is running down a hill into a pit. And at the bottom of that hill in the pit is a lion, two times his size. And here goes Benaiah, which brings me to my third question. Why would you chase a lion into a pit on a snowy day? This doesn't make any sense to me at all. So I started thinking, why would Benaiah have done this? Maybe he was a thrill seeker, right? He just, he loved the adrenaline. So he, you know, drank down his energy drink, throws it away, and here I go, I'm going to get the lion. Now, we would all agree that's a bad idea, right? There are a lot of ways to, to seek thrills. Chasing a lion into a pit on a snowy day is probably not the best one. Now, now maybe, maybe Benaiah is just a hunter. And some of you maybe know hunters who are really, really into hunting, and they just love the, the thrill of the chase and, and, and the kill. And maybe that's what it was, that Benaiah was hungry, and so he was hunting, and he was hoping to get some lion meat. I hear it tastes like chicken. I don't think that's what was going on here either, though. Because I'm thinking if Benaiah was a hunter, he probably gets the lion into the pit, goes home, gets his spear that he stole from the Egyptian, and throws it at the lion. Much safer, much better way to hunt. Now here's the thing. We know a little bit about what kind of person Benaiah was because this isn't the only place he's mentioned in the Bible. In fact, one of the things we know is that Benaiah was the captain of King David's bodyguards. Now I want you to think, what kind of person do you want to lead your bodyguards if you're the king? Because if you're the king, you have enemies. And there are people who want you dead. And so you need bodyguards who are tough and strong, but also who are responsible and reliable. And you want the captain of your bodyguards to be completely responsible, completely reliable, someone that you can absolutely trust. Probably not the kind of person who just for thrills chases lions in the pits on snowy days. So we can guess that probably Benaiah is a responsible guy. He's a reliable guy. He's a trustworthy guy. In fact, we know that he is.
Because right at the end of David's life, there, there was some, some fighting going on over who was going to be the next king. David had said, Solomon, my son, is going to be the next king. That's what God wanted to happen. The prophet Nathan said, this is what needs to happen. But Adonijah, one of David's other sons, tried to set himself up as king. Who did David turn to? He turned to Benaiah. Benaiah was his most trusted soldier. And it was Benaiah that worked with the prophet Nathan to make sure that Solomon was the next king of Israel. And Solomon then appointed Benaiah to be the general of all the armies of Israel. So you get in a picture of the kind of person Benaiah was. He's not a thrill seeker. He's not irresponsible. If he chased a lion into a pit on a snowy day, he had a good reason to do it. So what was that reason? Well, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. We can guess. We can think about it. Here's my best guess, and this is just me guessing, is that this lion was a danger. Maybe it was a danger to the people. Uh, lions eat people sometimes. Maybe it was a danger to the flocks, a danger to the children. For whatever reason, this lion was a danger and somebody had to take care of it. And Benaiah, he was courageous, he was strong, he was a great warrior, decided he would be the person who would take care of this problem for all of the people. So maybe that's how it happened. I don't know. But what do we do with a story like this? You know, we believe that, that God gave us the Bible. He inspired it for our benefit so that we could know him, understand who he is, know what he expects from us. And so oftentimes when we're reading the Bible, we ask the question, how do I apply this to my life? But if we ask that question about this story, it's not real obvious, is it? How do I apply this story to my life? Well, it is a snowy day. So I want all of you to go out and I want you to look for a pit that has a lion in it and run down into the pit and kill the lion with your hands. Now, if we all went and did that, I'm guessing our success rate as a group would be about 0%. Because I'm not sure I see anybody out here except for maybe Kirby who's capable of going down into a pit and killing a lion with their bare hands. So how do we apply this? This is one of those places in the Bible where we, we look at the Bible and we say sometimes... The Bible is not prescriptive, but it's descriptive. We don't do exactly what it says Benaiah did, but we understand the description of Benaiah and ask ourselves the question, what are some of the character traits Benaiah exhibits here? How does Benaiah behave like God? What's Benaiah's relationship with God like? And what does that mean for us? And here's what I draw out of this story. Benaiah was a courageous man. And God created all of us to live with courage. Now, last week, we talked about how to trust God in terrifying times. Because sometimes in life, you find yourself in a place where fear is overwhelming you. And so this week, we're going to flip the coin to the other side and say, we're not going to talk about fear today. We're going to talk about courage. And what does it mean for us to live lives of courage? Well, what is courage? What is courage not? Courage is not the loudest guy in the room. That guy's not courageous. Courage is, is not doing the easy thing or the fun thing. Uh, courage is not foolheartedly racing in where angels dare to tread, right? That's not courage. Wisdom says before you go anywhere, you count the cost, determine if it's worth it, and then you act. I think that's probably what Benaiah actually did. But courage isn't just racing willy-nilly into anything we, we think about. Courage is not being offensive just for the sake of offending. Now, if you act courageously and you live courageously, there may be times when you offend someone. But courage is not offending others just so that you can offend them. And courage is not being difficult just for the sake of getting what you want. Because actually, courage isn't about you at all. If I was going to write a definition of courage, this is what it would be. Courage is doing the right thing for the right reason at the right time. Courage is doing the right thing, and usually we know what the right thing is, for the right reason. See, if I'm doing something, it may even be the right thing, just for my own benefit, uh, for my own gain, that doesn't take any courage. Courage means I'm doing it for someone else. True courage is never self-centered. It's easy to do what I want to do. It's easy to do things 
for me. That's how I naturally am. Courage says, I'm not doing this for me, I'm doing it for others, because courage is about others. And courage is doing it at the right time. See, true courage never delays. If if I asked you today, I said, I want you just to think, just for a minute, what is one thing in life that you know you need to do? Probably every single one of us has the answer to that question right now. I know something that I need to do, but maybe it's a hard thing. Maybe it's difficult. Maybe it's scary and it brings fear, and so I put it off. Have you ever put anything off in your life? See, courage says I act now because I know this is right. This is a great time to talk about this because the new year is right around the corner. And this is the time of year when we start thinking about New Year's resolutions. And maybe some of you are really into resolutions and some of you are not. But probably all of us are thinking about how can I improve myself? What do I need to do better? What do I need to change? What do I need to add? What do I need to subtract? What do I need more of? What do I need less of? What habits or patterns are holding me back? What habits or patterns do I need to start? And whenever we think about all of these ideas, we need to add in a little bit of courage. Because we can know the right thing to do, and we can even have the right reasons to do it, but if we delay, if we put it off, it never gets done. And so we need, like Benaiah, to have courage in the moment, to do what God has called us to do. You know, at Christmas time, we are celebrating the greatest act of courage the world has ever known. And that's the coming of Jesus. The the God-man came down and became a baby just for us. He didn't have to do that. And I'll tell you what, it wasn't easy for God to be cloaked in flesh and have to live like one of us, have to live among us, have to endure us. And Jesus did all of that. Jesus came to earth just so he could die. He suffered physically on the cross. He suffered mentally when he was put on trial unjustly. He suffered emotionally when he was betrayed and abandoned by his best friends. And he knew all of that was going to happen. And yet because it was for us, He didn't hesitate. He didn't delay. He courageously stepped into human form to be our Savior. And Jesus didn't just do that to show us what courage was. He did it to give us courage, to provide us with courage. Listen to what Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 1.7. Paul writes, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of love and power, and self-discipline. Let me explain how this works. You see, Jesus came to earth, and he lived a perfect life. And then he allowed himself to be killed by imperfect men for the sake of imperfect all of us, because all of us are imperfect. And it's our imp- imperfections, it's our mistakes, it's our sins, it's our crimes against God that keep us from having a relationship with him. But when Jesus died on the cross, he took on himself the punishment for all of that. He took on himself the death that we deserved so that we can be made right with God. And so when I give my life to Jesus, he gives me in return his perfection. And so that in the eyes of God, I'm now okay. And because I'm now okay with God, he gives me his spirit to indwell me, to be my guide in life. And here's what Paul says about this, that God's spirit is not a spirit of fear. It is not a spirit of timidity. So when I know the right thing to do, and I'm doing it for the right reasons, but I delay because I'm afraid, that fear is not from God. That fear is not from his spirit. That's your nature trying to hold you back. But God's Spirit can conquer that because God's Spirit reminds you that you have power. You have the ability to do what He called you to do. God's Spirit fills you with love so that you know you're loved by Him and you can demonstrate that love to everyone around you. And it even says that God's Spirit gives you self-discipline, the ability to know what you need to do and do it. Here's why. 
When I have God's spirit in me, reminding me that I have power, that I have love, that I can do this, I know that no matter what might happen now, my future is secure. What holds me back from being courageous is fear. I'm afraid if I do what God has called me to do, then somebody might make fun of me. They might laugh at me. They might mock me. Jesus said, blessed are you when men persecute you and say all manner of evil against you. Why? Because he's got something better in the future. You might say, you know, if I live for God, if I do what I know I'm called to do, if I do what I'm created to do, I might lose something. I might lose relationships. I might lose position. I might lose power. Remember what Jesus said? He said, if you want to follow me, you need to be willing to lose everything because what does it profit you to gain the whole world but lose your soul? Hold things loosely. Why? Because I've got something better planned for you. You might say, you know what? It might be costly for me to do the right thing. It might be costly even financially for me to do the right thing. And Jesus said, follow me. I'll take care of you. I take care of the sparrow. I take care of the flowers in the field. Can I not also take care of you? Seek first my kingdom and let me take care of the rest. I've got something better for you. You see, when you listen to God's spirit, when he's given you that spirit and you listen to that spirit and you realize, I do have power. I am filled with God's love. I can discipline myself to be courageous. God gave you courage so that you can be and do exactly what he created you to be and do. Albert Einstein once once said, Every ship is safe at shore, but that's not what they were created for. You see, sometimes it's easy to take the safe way, isn't it? To say, I I, I know what I'm supposed to do. I know what God is calling me to do, but but right now I'm not ready. I'm going to delay. I'm going to play it safe. That is not what you were created to do. And so this morning, I want you to ask yourself the question, what am I created for? What has God created me to do? Who has God created me to be? And I want you to courageously step into that. Now, I know that for some of you this morning, some of this is new. Or maybe it's not new, but it's new in this moment. And all of a sudden, you're having this feeling in your heart, these thoughts in your mind that are saying to you, what I've been doing hasn't been working, and it's time for something new. I need to give my life to Jesus. I want to be right with God. I want his spirit in my life pouring that power and that love and that courage into me. And you can have that right now, right here. Simply go to God, to your Father, your Creator, and say, Father, I know I've not lived for you. I know I've messed up. I've made mistakes. I'm not perfect. But today, right here, right now, I'm giving my life to you, and I'm accepting Jesus' gift of salvation so that from now on I can live for you. That takes courage, but it's the right thing to do, and it will change your life. Maybe for some of you, you've done that and there's something else that God's tugging at your heart and right now, you're feeling it and you're hearing it and God's spirit is speaking to you and saying, this is what I created you for. This is what I made you to do. Will you listen to that? And will you courageously step into that? You know the right thing to do. You know why it's the right thing to do. And so this morning, I'm calling on you, do not delay. The time is now. This is what you were created for. So courageously step in to the life that God has given you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for creating us. Thank you for Christmas when we celebrate the great gift of Jesus. Thank you that he was willing to courageously come to earth and die in our place so that we could be restored to you, so we could enjoy the life that you made us to live. And this morning I want to pray for for all of us. For those who are here who need to give themselves to you for the first time, I pray that you would give them the courage to do that, that they would reach out to you. For those who who need to make a change in their life, who need to add or subtract something, who need to begin something new, who need to add something, Father, I pray that you'd give them the courage to step into that today, to, to live that life that you've created them to. We can never thank you enough for adopting us as your sons and daughters, for giving us this great privilege to come to you. Thank you for that. In your name.